We're trying to get people to feel uh, empowered to try to create new ways of seeing God in this world and of uh, living out the gospel. My name is Brendan Breed, and I teach Old Testament here at Columbia Theological Seminary. Uh, I am a newly uh, minted uh, associate professor of Old Testament studies, uh, and also I direct the QEP, the Quality Enhancement Plan. I think that there are two things happening in the church right now. There's more than two, of course, but there's two that I can see really clearly. One is things are, business is carrying on as usual in some churches. That is to say some churches are continuing to move along in the same way that they've moved along for centuries. Um, some of the big steeple churches and so on will be continuing into the future and some churches just aren't gonna change that much. But there are some churches that are thinking in new and different ways, thinking about ministry in new and different ways. Uh, there are churches that are uh, trying to uh, cross over denominational boundaries. There are churches that are trying to think in new and creative ways um, about social justice and about uh, involving themselves in the community. There are also churches that are thinking in new and different ways about scripture. How do we use it? How do we think about it? How do we read it together? How do we listen to other people who've read it and are talking about their experiences with it? Um, and that's in part what I'm excited about what Columbia gives people a chance to do. Uh, we have a lot of faculty here who encourage people to experiment, to try things out, to try new and different things. Uh, in a way we have some professors here who create kind of a lab space, um, some almost entrepreneurial ways of thinking about ministry. There are some certain ways that people have read the Bible for centuries that we know about that maybe uh, we can hear and learn from other people who read differently from us but also maybe we can engage in some new and different ways of reading scripture and understanding how God works in the Bible and outside the pages of it too. Let's try this again. I think I was muted. So good morning, friends. Uh, it's good to see so many of your faces here today. Um, if I wasn't muted, I apologize, but I think I'm unmuted now. Can I see some head nods if you can hear my words? All right, there we go. So um, if you haven't used Zoom in a while or um, you're using Zoom for the first time, you will experience this presentation best if you're in what they call speaker view. Um, so if you go to the top right hand corner of your screen, if you, um, if you see a lot of faces, then you're in the wrong view. That's gallery view. You want to be in the one where the person who's speaking is front and center and you see maybe a few heads at the top of the screen. Um, since we have a lot of folks on the Zoom call today, I've taken the courtesy, I've, uh, taken the courtesy for Dr. Breed of muting all of you. Um, when we get to the question and answer session, I'll make sure that we um, unmute those who have questions and give some additional instructions there. Um, a few additional words of uh, or pieces of information as we begin our time. We started this as a um, virtual recruitment event since COVID-19 has shifted all of our lives and required us to be distant from one another. We wanted a time to connect with prospective students and admitted students um, online. And we quickly um, saw that alums, current students, current faculty, current staff, um, and other friends of Columbia were registering. So we shifted a little bit because we believe this is what it means to be Columbia. One of the things that I um, have learned since coming here as a Dean of Students five years ago um, is that Columbia is a place that really values connection, values people, and values community. So we didn't want to, um, prevent anyone from being here. We figured this is actually Columbia at its best. You get to see a little bit of everyone. Um, so welcome to you, whether you're a prospective student, an admitted student, of, um, an alumni, I see some familiar faces. I see Sarah Smith, I think I see Glory Cumbo. It's so good to see all of you, um, welcome. Uh, the primary thing that we'll be doing today is hearing from Dr. Brennan Breed, the Associate Professor of Old Testament. Um, but before Dr. Breed comes on, I want to invite our president, Dr. Van Dyke, um, to share a brief word about how things are going at Columbia, and then she'll also introduce Dr. Breed. Um, let me unmute Dr. Van Dyke's video, or her sound. Thanks, Brandon. Welcome, everyone. I am delighted to share in this time with you Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. I know that anxieties run deep in our souls these days, and this is a kind of a gift to us to be together in this format. Um, I want to talk primarily to the people on the call who are considering Columbia Seminary as your next uh, location and God's call on your life, but I also want to welcome everybody else. Welcome everyone else as well. 
But for those folks that are considering Columbia, uh, what Brandon said is absolutely right. We are connected with each other, uh, with our call, with the great gifts of the Christian faith. Um, and we invite you to uh, join in who we are and uh, how we are attempting to uh, be faithful in these difficult times. Um, our faculty has, in the space of a, just a couple of days, managed to put all of their courses online so that our students can continue to learn. And that's what we're all about, uh, learning and formation and preparation for ministry. It's that faculty of Columbia Seminary that is a world-class uh, group of people that you would be able to come and get to know. I mean, just listen to some of these A-list names, people like Walter Brueggemann, Kathleen O'Connor, Anna Carter Florence, Marcia Riggs, Christine Roy Yoder, Mitzi Smith, Bill Brown, and I could go on to about 25 names. Dr. Brennan Breed is certainly part of our A-list team. I remember I met Brennan uh, just a couple days after I arrived on campus here in the summer of 2015. And I decided to go visit each professor in their office and just ask them, what do you like to think about? And the, my hour long conversation with Brennan Breed was really fun and amazing because I learned that he not only is an Old Testament biblical scholar, but he's really interested in medieval art, bluegrass music, archeology, span uh, philosophy, and he manages to kind of take all of these different fields and integrate them into his uh, really remarkable way of thinking. So I enjoyed getting to know Brennan uh, when I first arrived at, at Columbia's campus. So I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm going to pass the baton straight to Dr. Brennan Breed, who is going to uh, lead us in his lecture. Thank you, Brennan. Thank you very much, and uh, I, I just want to say uh, thank you to all of you uh, for, for being with us today. Um, this is a really interesting time uh, and an interesting opportunity for us to try out new and different things. So uh, we, um, we're grateful for your presence here, whether you're alums uh, or whether you're folks who are just uh, checking out the school for the first time. Um, but uh, uh, I, let me just move into to, to my, my talk today, which is on the book of Ecclesiastes. So I am uh, focusing in my research uh, on Ecclesiastes right now, um, uh, probably the strangest book in the Bible. Um, strange for a number of reasons. Number one uh, is that uh, a lot of ancient interpreters uh, seem to have actually wanted to, to make sure that Ecclesiastes didn't make it into the Bible. Uh, perhaps another reason it's strange is that uh, hardly anyone ever reads it. Um, <laughs> it is uh, uh, not in the, the lectionary, uh, the Christian lectionary, except on New Year's Day which I don't know how many of you have ever been to a New Year's Day uh, uh, church uh, uh, liturgy. Um, I, I think I never have. It's not uh, an important uh, day on the church calendar for, for most traditions. Uh, maybe for some folks it is. Um, but uh, in Ecclesiastes, uh, uh, we, we come up against some of the, some of the perhaps most um, uh, cynical, uh, uh, I might be able to say, uh, and uh, some of the most uh, direct and probing questions uh, that we might be able to find in the entire Bible. And for many Christians uh, and for many Jews throughout history, um, these kinds of questions have been troubling and troublesome. Uh, but that is precisely why I think Ecclesiastes is perfect for our time. Uh, it is a troublesome book and we live in a troublesome time. Uh, so if I can, uh, if, if you all have Ecclesiastes uh, of out, you know, I've, I'm holding my Bible here, I'm gonna refer to it and we'll, We'll take a little walk through it. Um, if you don't have a Bible with you, you can use uh, uh, one of your uh, cell devices or something else, or just even bring it up on the screen as I'm talking. Um, I'm not going to use a lot of visuals um, in this presentation, um, but I'm uh, uh, so you can you can mute my talking face uh, and, and look at the, the scripture instead. Um, but I think that uh, uh, if, we, if we start with Ecclesiastes chapter one, uh, we can walk through a few chapters of this book together um, and find, I think, some uh, some real wisdom for our time. Wisdom about, and my title is uh, Living Your Best Life in a Time of Crisis. Um, as a bit of background, the book of Ecclesiastes um, is uh, uh, a part of what we would call in the Bible the wisdom tradition. 
uh, the wisdom literature uh, is a subsection of the Bible in what the Jewish tradition would call the writings part of the canon. Uh, and uh, the, the three books of the wisdom tradition in the Christian canon, uh, uh, at least for most of us, the, some Christian traditions differ on this point, uh, but are uh, Proverbs and then Job and then Ecclesiastes. So what we're looking at is ancient wisdom literature. And whenever I begin reading the Bible, I always think it's really important for us to remember that ancient Israel is an ancient Near Eastern people. Uh, they worship and they pray and they scream to God. Uh, they uh, sacrifice uh, in ways that look very similar to some of their neighbors. And that is an interesting and important thing for us to remember, um, that uh, God speaks to us in ways that we can understand through human culture. Uh, if God's going to talk to us, it's going to have to be in a language that we understand. It's going to have to be um, through cultural practices and cultural concepts, through metaphors that we already in some way understand or that can be translated into our language. Um, so for, for us to encounter these words of uh, ancient scribes, it helps for us to remember when they lived and, and who they lived with and who they lived alongside and what made sense to them. So in any event, we have this ancient wisdom tradition uh, represented here in the book of Ecclesiastes. And in wisdom literature, uh, the main important thing uh, is that it's a, uh, a practice of sages or wise people uh, who have reflected for a long time on the principles uh, of wisdom that they can see in the world. Um, this is really different from what we would find in like uh, the Ten Commandments or something on Sinai. God hands down a law, like a bunch of information to people. We, we would call this in theological terms, special revelation, right? Special words that only Moses knows. And you can't just come up with the Ten Commandments by, I don't know, uh, osmosis or something. Um, you, and you can't really just look at a waterfall or nature and come up with the exact Ten Commandments that Moses got, or that special name, Yahweh, which was revealed to Moses. When we look at Proverbs and Job and Ecclesiastes, we're looking at something slightly different. And we're looking at um, human reflection on the world uh, with, that we, we hope uh, and we believe uh, has re reflections of, of the divine in it. That is that we can find God through this kind of observation practice. So uh, for example, in Proverbs six, uh, the, the speaker says, oh, go to the ants and check them out. You know, the ants have something to teach you about how God made the world. So in the same way, the book of Ecclesiastes is really all about somebody who was going on a quest, a journey, like a, a spiritual journey or maybe a philosophical journey. They're trying to figure out what is good in the world and what actually, how the world actually works. Uh, and we think it was written by someone in, or several people in times of crisis. Um, uh, this is my own <clears throat> research that, that I've been working on here. A lot of Christians would say that Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes, but if you look at the book, it actually doesn't say that, it, that Solomon wrote it. It says a son of David, but that could really be anyone related to David throughout history. And the particular language that Ecclesiastes is written in sounds a lot like, suspiciously like, very late biblical Hebrew. Um, we imagine, that is a lot of biblical scholars today imagine that Ecclesiastes um, was written sort of in the guise of Solomon, um, but was somebody who was reflecting at a time when the, the Greek empires were on the rise and Rome was on the horizon, a particularly um, bad point in time for, uh, for Jewish history, um, a, a point in time when there was uh, uh, a great oppression that was on the rise. So we, we think this is someone living in a culture um, and in a, a particular historical moment of, of real crisis. Uh, and part of this is that, that that crisis is felt throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, it's someone who is looking at a world that seems to have fallen apart or that is in the process of falling apart, where nothing seems very reliable in the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, this is, seems a bit different from, say, like Deuteronomy, where it says, if you do good, good things happen. And if you do bad things, bad things happen after, you know, as a consequence, which works sometimes, but doesn't work all the time, which is why we have books like Ecclesiastes. Um, they, they give us a slightly different word, maybe, for different times. So look, look with me at, uh, at uh, chapter 1, verse 1 of Ecclesiastes, and it says, the words of, and I'm reading from the NRSV, the New Revised Standard, but of course, lots of different translations are great uh, uh, the, of the Bible. Um, so you may have different translations than me. I'll try to fill in some words um, here that your translation may have or not have. Um, so that we're on the same page. But it says, the words of the teacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Uh, the teacher. Uh, if you have a little translational note, your, or your translation might say preacher or something like that. My little translational note says Hebrew, Kohelet. 
traditionally rendered preacher. Uh, that was a, a Martin Luther who re rendered this preacher. Um, well, I, although it was a medieval tradition too to call it the preacher. Um, this is a, a very strange word. Uh, this is not Solomon's name. Uh, Kohelet, which is the Jewish name of the book, uh, the teacher. Um, uh, this really means someone who assembles things, the assembler. Um, preacher means that they're assembling people. That's like one interpretation, but it also might be someone who assembles teaching. Uh, so and so on. Um, they call themselves a king here, king in Jerusalem. They kind of take on the persona of a king in chapters one and two, but then that persona goes away. And it's really interesting to see that for the rest of the book, they, they act a bit like a scribe, like someone who has to talk to kings and gets frustrated with kings. Um, so, but all to say, uh, this is where I want to begin right here, really, uh, in uh, uh, in verse, uh, verse uh, two, in which we call the motto of the book of Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher, or Kohelet. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now, I don't know if you have a Bible with little study notes, um, but this is the most important word of the whole book of Ecclesiastes, is vanity. Uh, and it does not mean what most people think vanity means in English. This is a big surprise. So vanity, either some people use it to mean a dresser, like a wardrobe, uh, but a lot of people use it to mean uh, like someone who like looks at themselves and thinks very highly of themselves or is really concerned with how they look uh, or someone who, I don't know, walks around with a selfie stick all day. Well, you know, th th this, this is kind of, these are the, uh, the, the presumptions that come into some people's minds when they hear that, that word vanity, right? Um, but that's not at all what the Hebrew word means. The Hebrew word is hevel, um, H-E-B-E-L, really. You can pronounce the B in Hebrew like a V. Hevel. Um, so hevel. And what it really means is breath, vapor or mist or breath or air. And so it doesn't mean vanity like you think that you're, 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 you're high on yourself or something. Um, instead, it means something that is there in a moment and then gone, which used to be a, a meaning of the word vanity, something that was there and then gone. And it, we've lost it a bit over time. It's still there in, in the background um, of English. Uh, uh, but but all the same, it's probably better to think of this as like breath of breaths. And if you think of uh, vanity of vanities, uh, like song of songs or holy of holies, this is a Hebrew way of, of speaking. And it's the way that they do superlatives. When something's awesome or the best, they'll say blank of blanks. So song of songs means the awesomest of songs. Um, or the holy of holies means the holiest of places. So here, this means vanity of vanities. We might translate as the breathiest of breathiness, of breathiness or something like that, which I'll get to what that means in a moment, but it's supposed to be confusing, I think. Uh, breath of breaths, the, the most vapor-like stuff possible, says the teacher. Vapor-like stuff of vapor-like stuff. All in the world is vapor-like stuff. And in Hebrew, it says hakol, the all. Everything is vapor-like stuff. Um, so we might think for a second about what, what is breath? And what is, what is it when we breathe? It's not, it's not nothing. Uh, vanity sounds bad or negative. Breath is not bad. Vapor is not bad. We, we all need air to live, right? But some of the things that define air as it relates to our bodies and our lives are that I need it, but I only have it for a second and I have to let it go. I can take it in, but I have to let it go. And this defines my life. I have to keep breathing in order to live. Um, uh, we're all highly aware of this now in the, in the time of COVID-19, right? That this is a thing that attacks your ability to breathe. Um, and that breath is important. And the fact that it needs to go on and, and no breath is more important than any other breath. And no breath lasts longer than any other breath unless you hold it, right? Um, uh, but, but nothing, it can't last forever. Um, it is there, it's gone, but it nevertheless is the structure and substance of our lives. We depend upon that breath. Um, I think this is, there's another thing to think about breath is that you can't hold it. You can't grab it. You can't weigh it. Uh, well, you, maybe you can weigh breath, but it's hard to think about, right? It's hard to do for any, any person who's not a scientist. Um, so an ancient Israelite would think about breath and they would think it's something you can't hold on to. It's ephemeral. It leaves in a second, but also you need it. It's the, the substance of life. And this is going to be the theme of the entire book of Ecclesiastes. Our life is not a, a, a thing of stasis. We can't stay the same. We have to always continually do more. And that this is both something that is, um, it can make us feel a bit depressed perhaps sometimes. Um, it can also uh, sometimes knock us off our, our, uh, uh, our uh, the, off the mountain if we think we've climbed to the very top of it. 
but it's also the thing we need for our lives. So I'm gonna dig into this a, a bit more in terms of how the text goes on. So then from verse two on, we have a poem, this really, I think, beautiful poem that begins with people and ends with people, but diverts into nature. And so I'll, I'll look at this metaphor for a moment here. What do people gain from all the toil at which they toil under the sun? So life is toil. And that word really is a word that means like toil, like working hard, it's hard work, right? What do people gain? And that word gain there in, in Hebrew, it's yitrom, which really means the, the, the excess, or we might think of it in economic, this book is really interested in economics and uh, uses economic terms. And that's an economic term that we might say in the ancient world meant profit. What does it profit? What is the excess that you get from all this hard work at which you are working under the sun? And under the sun usually means um, uh, just on the, on the earth. Like on our days, we add up all our days. There's, there's, it's always hard work and there's always more of it, isn't there, right? So, and you look at verse four, a generation goes, a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. Ah, maybe the earth has the stability that the, that the human body lacks, but actually then it goes in to talk about the earth and it turns out the earth might remain for, forever. Well, at least for an age, that word doesn't really mean forever in Hebrew. It means for, for an age, for a very, very long time. Um, olam is the word. A sun the sun rises and the sun goes down and hurries to the place where it rises. Poor sun, right? It never gets a day off. Uh, it, it, it doesn't just, it doesn't have the ability to sit around and enjoy itself, right? If it takes any time off, what happens to the universe? Imagine if the sun took, took some time off and just relaxed, right? Um, we would have chaos on earth, but also um, eventually uh, we would not have energy and our earth would die. Our life depends upon this kind of endless cycle of hard work that the sun is doing. Uh, and then uh, verse six, the wind blows to the south and goes around to the north, round and round goes the wind and on its circuits, the wind returns. And then again in verse seven, all streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full to the place where the streams flow, they continue there, they continue to flow. That is that the, the streams are always pouring water. And we might look at this and say, oh my goodness, this just sounds, uh, if I was the stream, I would be so upset. I would never have a, a weekend, right? Um, the streams are always flowing. But what happens if the streams stop? What happens if the streams actually fill up the sea and then stop running? What would happen is that the life on earth, what if the wind stopped, right? The wind stopped blowing and the, that means the weather patterns stopped moving and the rain stopped coming. That means that life would cease. That is to say, we are dependent, our lives every moment from nature to our own uh, bodily respiration. Our whole cosmos is dependent upon motion and moving and transformation and change. And it is ceaseless. Um, What's interesting is then it moves back to the human beings and it says in verse eight, all things, this sounds wearisome, doesn't it sound a bit tiring, right? Oh, all things are wearisome, more than one can express. The eye is not satisfied with hearing or the, uh, with seeing or the ear filled with hearing. Boy, we, we just keep seeing things and hearing things. You're never done seeing and hearing things, are you? Um, uh, this may, may, might sound a bit depressing or wearisome. It, it tires out this person, Kohelet, who is reflecting on, his, on how, the, how the world works like this. Um, this person, we think, lived in a time of immense transformation and upheaval and yet had to get up and do their scribal work every day, um, even in the midst of all that change, and never really got this break, right? Um, but then again, if the human ear filled up with hearing, if you had heard everything you ever needed to hear, and you could just finish, right? And you had said everything that you would ever need to say or see everything that you would ever need to see from here on out. That would be death. That would be, that would be the end. And this is the other main theme of Kohelet is that we are mortal. And the, even parts of our cosmos, right? Everything in it um, has an end point. Um, there, there, there is an end. And that sounds like a depressing thing for a book to be about, doesn't it? Um, and yet it is so honest, it is true that we are mortal and we are up against this reality every single moment uh, of this uh, current crisis. And really we're up against it every moment of every day of our lives, whether we try to believe it or think about it or not, right? Or we try to distract ourselves from thinking about our mortality. Um, but Kohelet is so fascinated. Uh, the whole book of Ecclesiastes is fascinated in this idea that we actually are mortal. And it's really important for Kohelet to keep reminding us of this. In fact, Kohelet, this book Ecclesiastes, uh, spawned a tradition in the medieval period called Memento Mori. Uh, this draws also on ancient Roman practices and so on, but still in the Christian tradition it was associated with Ecclesiastes. And there are whole uh, uh, styles of paintings called vanitas paintings that come from Ecclesiastes chapter one, that vanity of vanities. And what they do is they, they paint 
uh, things that are about to die or about to about to end, like flowers, as as they are turning uh, and starting to lose um, their beauty, uh, or things that like a bubble that is here and then gone the next moment, um, but is nevertheless beautiful. And what Kohelet's whole message is is that the beauty and wonder and amazing quality of life is dependent on these ephemeral things that you can't grab and hold on to and take with you. There's no profit, excess that you can take with you and, and it is yours in some kind of universal way, right? Uh, uh, th this doesn't mean that we shouldn't try for things, but that we need to think about our joy, our happiness in a different way than just accumulating things um, or in getting to the place where we are finally done. We've done it, right? Uh, I made it. I, I conquered this, right? You know, um, I, I, you can think about, so this is a little story from my own life, right? Um, uh, I, this, this, this past year, uh, thanks be to the faculty of Columbia Seminary, to the students, to the uh, administration, uh, to President Van Dyke uh, and to the board, um, I got tenure this past year, um, which is an amazing uh, and, and, and hard fought thing for me to get. And, uh, and it didn't like solve my problems, <laughs> you know? It's this thing I've been striving for for decades now and I got there and I woke up the next day and took my dog for a walk and my kids were whining and I had to take out the trash and it was just my life again, right? Uh, and the thing that got me excited again about living was to realize, yeah, that was there and it's gone and I've got to find something else. We have to find something else to pursue. Um, this is a, a huge part of this, of this book. And so uh, the Ecclesiastes then jump the, 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 the speaker, I, I'll call this person Kohelet, that name for assembler in verse one. Um, this person, uh, uh, and by the way, that's where the name Ecclesiastes come from, comes from. That's just the Greek, ecclesia, which means church, right? That just means the town assembly. It's a word that Christians stole and kind of used for themselves to uh, talk about their own meetings, their, their town assemblies. Um, but that also, the, the word, it comes from assemble. Uh, so here, the assembler, uh, the, the, the teacher, the preacher, the gatherer, um, that is uh, the, the, book, the Ecclesiastes, right? So, so I'll call that person Kohelet, to use the Hebrew term here. So Kohelet then jumps into this really amazing, I think, uh, thought puzzle. Uh, it's like a thought experiment. They're going to try out everything. Where can you find lasting joy that is just going to, what, what can you accumulate? What experience can you get that's going to stick with you forever? That's going to continue to fill you up with joy, right? Um, so uh, uh, in verse 12, it says, I, the teacher, this is the name for Kohelet again, when king over Israel and Jerusalem applied my mind to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. So I'm going to use my wisdom to figure this out. It's an unhappy business that God has given to human beings to be busy with. So in other words, I'm going to try to figure out the puzzle, the unsatisfying puzzle sometimes of human life. I'm going to solve it with my brain, right? So then verse 14, I saw all the deeds that are done under the sun, and see, all is hevel, breath, vanity, and a chasing after wind, which I love. That word also might be herding, a herding of the wind, like herding cats. You know, the world, your, your entire life, your experience here on earth is a bit like herding cats. You get things together in an order and then the, everything falls apart, right? They, the cats all run away. Um, uh, and then he says in verse 15, what is crooked cannot be made straight and what is lacking cannot be counted. That is, there's something lacking in the universe or the cosmos that means that you can't use your brain to add it all up. In chapter seven, the very end of chapter seven, uh, Kohelet will say that you can't account for the entire world like it's an accounting book and sum it all up and make it all make sense. And I love this idea that the, the world is crooked. God made this kind of crooked world so that we can't quite figure it all out. Because if you did figure it all out, that would be the end. Just like the end of all your hearing and the end of all your seeing, the end of all your desire, that's death. And until we die, we are called to live our lives with reckless abandon, following love and passion and joy. And that's what Ecclesiastes will actually get to. Um, so in any event, uh, the, I'll, I'll skim this next part. Uh, but in the rest of chapter one and in the chapter two, there's this like thought uh, experiment where this person said, I'm going to try to live every possible um, uh, amazing scenario in my life. I'm going to uh, I'm going to drink as much as I can, right? Uh, if you think about this kind of as the rock star lifestyle, I'm just going to be a rock star for a little while and try out, how, see how that is and try to use food and, and drink and so on to cheer my body and my mind. And then the person says, hmm, I mean, it worked for a little while, but it eventually was vanity. It was pure vanity, according to chapter two, uh, verse one. I wanted to try pleasure, just instant gratification. And it worked for a bit, but it ended up 
being is just as unfulfilling as right. And we know this from all those stories, right? Now, this is where I would say we need to, as Christians, be really careful not to think of Jesus as, as this, the solution to our sadness, uh, of the lasting and eternal solution to the problem of living. Um, I know that we are kind of uh, uh, programmed to think about Jesus this way, um, but Jesus didn't think about Jesus this way. Um, Jesus didn't say, I came here to take away all of your problems and to make it so that nothing bad ever happened to you and that you didn't have to struggle with, with your own existence. Jesus said, I came here to, to take, give you a cross and to pick it up and, and follow after me. That is to say that there is um, this kind of toil or hard work that's bound up in the gospel even after we receive Jesus. Um, so all to say this, um, uh, uh, if, if we think that if we market Jesus, you know, and, and to use that cruel and kind of crude term, right? If we think about marketing Jesus to people um, uh, as if Jesus is going to take away all of their pain forever and take away all their sadness forever and make everything great, um, we have just made Jesus into heroin, right? I mean, like that's the point of using these these drugs like this is that. Uh, the idea of it is it actually kills, it numbs your, your pain circuits and it overloads your pleasure circuits. But as we all also know from people that we have, people we have known personally who have struggled with this, right? Um, that only works for so long. And then, then there begins this slide towards death. Um, that is to say, uh, overloading the pleasure circuits is a very short term uh, and non-lasting solution to the problem of the exist existence. And Jesus doesn't, I, I don't think Jesus tells us to follow this. This is not the gospel, right? That Jesus fulfills all these needs for us. Like you can buy Jesus in the vending machine and so on. So instead of pleasure or just happiness, Jesus is gonna make me happy or, or, or I'm just gonna find good stuff to make me happy or, or bad stuff to make me happy. Um, instead, Kohelet then says, what if I achieve things? What if I achieve grand and wonderful and amazing things? So I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards in chapter two, verse four. I made pools, I bought slaves. And this is an important part of uh, the story of the use or reception of Kohelet, is that at least as far as I can discern, um, J. Cameron Carter is the person who, uh, uh, who's uh, uh, now at, at Indiana University um, in African American studies, um, but is also a theologian. Um, he uh, pointed out that the, the, the first ever known um, abolitionist sermon, that is a sermon preached by a Christian uh, that said that uh, slavery should itself be entirely, um, uh, it should be an illegal practice uh, and it should not be tolerated within the church. Um, that was actually in the fourth century, one of the Cappadocians, uh, Basil of Caesarea, uh, who preached uh, a sermon on Ecclesiastes 2 on Easter day. Uh, and on that Easter day sermon uh, declared for the first time that we know of in Christian history um, that Ecclesiastes 2.7 said that uh, the purchasing and, and holding of slaves uh, was, was itself a vanity. Um, and so he took this in a negative sense and said, but, but it's also in a negative sense here that uh, the domination of other people has for long, for a long period, I mean, ever it's as far back as we can find in the historical record, the, the thought, I will dominate these other people. And I will, uh, I will then get lasting pleasure for myself or gain something lasting for myself. That has been a constant temptation throughout human society in many different forms. And here it is critiqued. Um, these great achievements, uh, piling up silver and gold for yourself, uh, building great works for yourself that will carry on your name in perpetuity, or at least so people think. Um, these things might make you be greater than all the other people around you in terms of your uh, stature in verse, chapter two, verse nine. So I became great. I surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem and I was wise, right? And then verse 10, whatever my eyes desired, I didn't keep from them. And I kept my heart from no pleasure. I just did whatever I wanted to do. And pleasure was my reward. And all this was my reward for all my toil. This was my reward. That's all you get. Then I considered that all my hands had done. And this is a joke because he had, he didn't build those things himself. He got other people, he forced other people to build them, right? I considered all my hands had done. That is nothing. And all the toil I had spent in doing it, I had wasted a lot of time and energy doing this stuff and all was hevel and a chasing after wind or a herding of the cats. And there was nothing to be gained under the sun. That word gain there at the end of verse 11, that's profit. Again, that word Hebrew word yitron. So uh, I, I, there's nothing of lasting profit there. So then Kohelet moves and kind of moves into this uh, other um, uh, possibility, uh, another piece of the thought puzzle. And then in chapter, uh, kind of continues in chapter two with that, with that story. Uh, and, then, uh, and then in verse 24 of chapter two, there's this little um, aside. That may, maybe the, this is, this is a, a theme in, in Ecclesiastes and Kohelet will come back to it time and again. So we call this one of the refrains of Ecclesiastes. And this is a little clue that this is uh, the fact that it's repeated many times 
like vanity of vanities is repeated at the end of the book. Um, this, this repetition here uh, signals to us that this is really important and perhaps the, the core teaching of the book. And so it'll start here in verse 24. There is nothing better for mortals than to eat and drink and find enjoyment in their toil. This also I saw was from the hand of God. For apart from God, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases God, God gives wisdom and knowledge of joy. To the sinner, there's gathering and heaping only to give to the one who pleases God. This is vanity and the chasing after wind. So even if you think you're, you're I'm, I'm good and other bad people get bad things, even that's a vanity and a chasing after of wind. The only thing that's positive there in that bit uh, is not that even gathering up of righteousness is not something you can take with you in the end. Uh, verse 24 and 25 is the real core there. There's nothing better than for us to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all of our toil. That is, it's not uh, like drinking to excess that he said, he said that was bad at the beginning of chapter two. But the point is, try to enjoy these little pleasures that exist in the world around us. This amazing beauty in these little things, like what did you eat for lunch today? Uh, uh, did, you know, there, there's this uh, little practice, a Zen practice of staring at one bean uh, and trying to see the world and imagine the world that is inside that one bean and really perceive the beauty of one tiny little, you know, kidney bean or something, right? Um, now, some of us have, have, have got some kidney beans on hand and so on for the, for the quarantine period. So uh, you can stare at your little kidney bean and see an entire world in there, right? Uh, you're stuck in your house, but your, your house is a cosmos of beauty and wonder, uh, no matter what state it's in, like perhaps like mine, messy. Um, uh, but nonetheless, uh, 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 we are kind of in this cycle of hard work on earth, and yet there is this enjoyment that can be found. And in chapter two, it says it's not going to be found in like the immediate gratification pleasure, although that's not bad, it's just not gonna fulfill us uh, for the long haul. Um, but it's also not, not really found in our achievements. And it's not really found uh, uh, in, in our status, right? You get the status and then you're done. I mean, it's, it's crazy to me that like Jeff Bezos isn't done. He's got, I don't know, $100 billion and he still like every day wakes up and like is on the grind, right? Trying to make more money and perhaps by treating his workers poorly, um, which also is treated in the book of Ecclesiastes, that, uh, that, that, that uh, idea in chapter four. Um, but nonetheless, uh, this idea of like people uh, uh, have to kind of wake up and continue to go, right? That's the reason I get up in the mornings because I haven't done all the things on my to-do list. And if I got done with all of the things on my forever to-do list, what would I be looking forward to, right? What would, I, what would I be doing? I would have to come up with something else to put in my forever to-do list in order to keep me going. And that's what Ecclesiastes is all about. We can find enjoyment in the midst of our toil. And even, I, like I said, I think this person is in the midst of a world historical crisis. And even in the midst of that crisis, this person says, we've got, you know, if you've got a little bit to drink and a little bit to eat, and you've got something that, to do with your hands, there's enough there to find some beauty and some wonder. So from there, and I'll uh, uh, speak for about five more minutes, um, and I've got a couple more things to point out here, but um, in uh, chapter three, there's this poem. That's the one thing that's in the, uh, the, the Christian revised, the revised Christian lectionary, the common lectionary, you, the ecumenical one. It's this poem right here, um, uh, and you might know it from the bird's song, right? Uh, for everything, there is a season and a time uh, to be born and a time to die and so on. Um, I think th this, this poem probably predates Ecclesiastes, I think. He's, he does this a, a number of times, uh, Kohelet uh, borrows poems and, and songs from other, from other times and places, but then usually writes on a little um, philosophical explanation for them at the end. And that's where we find that, uh, that Kohelet, I don't know if Kohelet agrees with this poem exactly. So uh, there's a, not that, that Kohelet disagrees. There's a time for all these things, a time to die, a time to be born, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to mourn, and a time to... Uh, uh, embrace and refrain from embracing. That's right now with COVID-19, right? No embracing. Um, there is a time for all these things, but then Kohelet says in verse nine, what gain or profit have workers from all their toil? Uh, that is, we got this metaphor of human beings being people who are working hard. And what do we actually have that profits us? Like, what do we get from all this? If we, even if we know the times for these things. And in verse 10, I have seen the busyness that God has given everyone to be busy with. Uh, yeah, you're not the only one who has busy work. Uh, we, we all have it, right? It's, it's part, part, of, part of life itself. God has made everything suitable for its time. So all these times, God made a time for everything. Moreover, God has put a sense of past and future into their minds, yet they cannot find out what God has done from beginning to end. Now, this verse might sound different in your translation because it is one of the most confusing verses in the entire Bible. Um, what it really says in the Hebrew is that God took the olam, God took 
eternity is the way it's usually translated. But like I said, they don't really have a notion of infinity, eternity, eternity in ancient uh, Israelite thought. They're just not, they don't have a philosophical category yet. Um, but they had this idea of a kind of long time or an age, um, like age to age, right? So uh, for a indeterminately long period of time, God took that sense of past and future or sense of eternity and put it into the human brain, shoved it into the human mind. And that word yet in the NRSV in verse 11, I, I, it really is the word so that so that they cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. In other words, God took, you know, you know how animals kind of know what time it is. They, they wake up generally at the same time. They go, so they don't need alarm clocks. Uh, they also just kind of like know that the, if an earthquake's coming, they just know stuff. And human beings don't. We don't know what time it is. I, I sleep in, but I don't mean to. I, I stay up too late. Um, I oftentimes, uh, you know, don't, don't time things correctly. You know, had I known the stock market was going to work in exactly this way, maybe I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't still be working, uh, you know, <laughs> a, job, a nine to five job, right? Um, I don't know what time it is. Um, and God has put this sense of eternity into our brains so that we don't actually know it. So human beings don't actually, we, we've lost kind of touch in some way with this direct knowledge of what time it's supposed to be. But also this is what God has done. God did this to us, and it's kind of God's gift. Um, this is a, a complex and, and too long thing um, uh, uh, to go into now, but just to say this is the ability. I think that this um, distancing that we get from our, ourselves is also the space that we need to think about things, to reflect on things, the space that's created by, by separating us from uh, the immediate knowledge of when things are supposed to happen, like like animals, right? My dog, she just she just she's never out of touch, with, but she just kind of she doesn't get embarrassed. She doesn't think about herself very much, right? I mean, she doesn't know she's naked. She's happy uh, wherever she is, pretty much, um, unless unless there's an immediate danger to her. Um, uh, she, you know, somebody bumps into her and she doesn't, hey, watch out, you know, my, my dog just doesn't deal with a lot of these complicated emotions that I seem to have and that other people seem to have. And in part, um, this is this function of this distancing that we have from the animal world in some way, but also kind of nature itself. But I think that distancing, which creates kind of this awkwardness, we don't know what time it is. We, we often overthink things or we think, we think about ourselves. We, we have this kind of outside view of ourselves where we start to question what we look like and what other people think about us. And what are you all thinking about me right, right, right now? Do you think I'm strange or I talk too fast or, you know, all of this is actually what's really important. The important part of all that is it's a function of reflection and thinking. We are given the space to think about things, which means we can't know about them. If you knew everything already, if you knew what COVID-19 means for you, or if you knew what you're supposed to do with your life after this, or if you knew when to invest in the stock market, it would all be over for you. You wouldn't have any suspense in your life. You wouldn't actually be living your life. Um, you wouldn't certainly wouldn't be living your best life. You would be following a script or something like that. Um, so the fact that you don't know what to do right now, the fact that you don't know where to go, the fact that uh, th this is also what is required to give you freedom, the ability to make choices. You need to have that space. Also, it's the, the very thing that can mean that you can back up and notice beauty. My dog doesn't notice beauty. Um, I love my dog so much, um, but she's not gonna stop and reflect upon a song and, and say, wow, that was really beautiful or look at a sunset and think anything except for, is that squirrel over there? I kind of get that squirrel, right? Um, uh, but we have this kind of innate curiosity and desire to think and reflect and even appreciate uh, the beauty of things. And that noticing of beauty also means we, we, can't, we can't understand it all yet. Uh, so all to say, this is our God-given task. Uh, yeah, in verse 12, I know that there's nothing better for them than to be, that is for all people, than to be happy and enjoy themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it's God's gift that all should eat and drink and take pleasure in all their toil. Again, that refrain. I know that nothing I know that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken away from it. God has done this, so we should all stand in awe before him. But what does it mean to stand in awe? It means to stand in wonder and to not know all the answers. So, uh, in any event, uh, oh, and also that, that end, verse 15, that which is already has been, that which is to be already is, and God seeks out what has gone by. Really interesting. That doesn't mean that at all. Um, God seeks out what has gone by. It means God seeks pursuit. That's what the Hebrew says. God seeks pursuit pursuing. God desires, and that, that word seek can also mean kind of wants, um, you know, tries to create a situation where this happens. God is trying to create pursuit. That's what God wants in us and for us, because that's life itself. Our, the fact that we don't know what's going on, 
gives us the ability to really be ourselves and to create a self and to create a space where we are something and we want something and we do something. Um, but God seeks pursuit. Uh, and some of the frustrations of our lives are actually um, a function, like they're required for us to have, uh, to, to be human, to be who we really are, to be our best selves. Uh, in chapter four, I, I'll, I'll end up and wrap up in just one minute. Um, in chapter four, we also get a notice of that the world is full of oppression. Uh, and that the world is full of, uh, of, of oppression and often uh, with, with, with no comfort, with people who uh, are ig ignorant of the oppression or people who uh, turn, uh, 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 you know, sort of turn, turn away and refuse to see the oppression, uh, refuse to notice it, and there's no one to comfort them. Uh, that this is uh, another charge in the book of Kohelet that we notice and we witness and we speak up and we get involved. Um, so let me end with this. Uh, uh, in uh, chapter 9, of, uh, I think this is kind of the final refrain here. Uh, there's a, ref uh, a reflection on death uh, and mortality, that all people will die. And this is something we know about ourselves. And now this might sound uh, strange or, or bizarre that I keep bringing this up, that we, that, that we will die. But I just want to remind us, we all are mortal. And there is an upside to this. Um, even, for, even within our own mortality, the knowledge that we are mortal helps us to understand and appreciate and enjoy just like that mental distance um, between knowing and, uh, and being, um, that mental distance between us living now and our future death, which we know will come one day, um, that actually gives us the ability to enjoy. Uh, this amazing study was done. Uh, the New York Times uh, about uh, uh, maybe a year ago published an article about it, um, uh, that there was a, a series actually of studies done where people were reminded in the morning that they were gonna die. And then there was a control group that was not reminded that they were going to die. And by the end of the day, they were asked how happy they were. And the group that started out not being asked how, how uh, that they were going to die and then asked how happy they were during the day, uh, and then this, they, they were, began to be reminded in the morning of their death, they reported significant, statistically significant, increases in happiness based at the end of their day, based on the knowledge that they were going to die in the morning. This memento mori, remember you are mortal. Uh, remember that you, uh, so the Ash Wednesday, uh, we're still in the season of Lent. Um, and what Ash Wednesday starts with someone uh, putting dust on you and saying, uh, remember that you are dust and to dust you will return. Uh, you are breath, <sighs> you are heaven. And one day to breath and to heaven you will return. You will return your breath to God uh, is how Ecclesiastes puts it. Um, this sounds uh, uh, sad in some way, and it is, um, but at the same time, uh, remembering that we are mortal uh, helps us to treasure every moment. And uh, it's amazing to me that people noticed uh, their, their loved ones more when they were rem reminded that they were going to die. They paid more attention to their loved ones. They loved their loved ones more. They held on to those moments that might annoy us uh, before we were reminded of that. Um, and then uh, this is where I'll, I'll end in chapter nine, verses seven through 10. Uh, there's this uh, 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 kind of the summation of the, of, of the, the uh, enjoy uh, passages here. Go, eat your bread with enjoyment and drink your wine with a merry heart for God has long ago approved of what you do. That is, God's been okay with you for millennia before you were born. You don't need to worry about that. What you need to worry about is this gift that you've been given and enjoying it, even in the midst of crisis and chaos, which sometimes are the very thing that, that awaken us to the possibility of enjoyment in the first place. And then uh, uh, verse eight, uh, let your garments always be white. That is to say, uh, not mourning, not, not uh, uh, you know, in, actually enjoy your life. Uh, uh, don't let your remi being reminded of your death lead you to mourn yourself in advance. Instead, let it free you to live. Do not let oil be lacking on your head. This is like, like a, a sort of perfume and, you know, like fix yourself up like you're going to go out every day, right? Uh, even if you're trapped in your house. Uh, in verse nine, enjoy life with the wife or the husband or the, the partner, whomever, uh, whom you love. Enjoy life with the person whom you love all the days of your vain life. That's of your hevel life, your breathy life that you are given under, under the sun because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, whatever you decide to do, do it with all your might. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol, that is the land of the dead to which you are going. Now, Ecclesiastes didn't know about Jesus. But even if Ecclesiastes knew about Jesus, I am pretty sure that the book would still tell us, um, one day you will be resurrected. But that doesn't mean don't, you shouldn't enjoy your life now. You shouldn't be fully committed to every moment of this life because it's not going to come back. Um, whatever it's going to be after in, in the world to come, uh, it is not going to look quite like this. So enjoy this one time, even in the midst 
of, of our lack of knowledge and wisdom when we don't know where we are going. Uh, well, I'll end there um, and, uh, and I'll, I'll be happy to take some comments and questions and there's lots of the book that I didn't touch on, but I just wanted to get those core elements of the book in place um, to try to give you a bit of a um, uh, encouragement uh, that the Bible has been there before us. Uh, maybe not in the exact way that COVID-19 is working, um, but in all of the feelings that we have, uh, uh, God's been there before. Well, Dr. Breed, we are extremely grateful for you taking some time to um conduct or host our first faculty lecture. Um, I don't know, I know you're Episcopalian, but for a moment I thought you might be a Baptist preacher because you walked us through the entire book in a matter of 45 minutes. <laughs> Come on now, yeah. <laughs> uh, Dr. Breed mentioned we do have some space for questions. We have about 10 minutes. I have given you all the ability to unmute yourselves um, so that you can ask a, ask a question if you so choose. I do want to signal that we have about 10 minutes for questions and then um, we'll have a couple of breakout rooms. So if you're a prospective student or an admitted student and wanna talk with our financial aid and admissions team, we'll have a breakout room for you. And if you're an alum or a friend of CTS, we'll invite you to remain right here in this room. Um, Julie Bailey, who leads um, our alumni and church relations um, is on the call and uh, so is Dr. Van Dyke. And so they'll remain here in this session to speak with uh, alumni and friends of CTS. But for now, let's do some questions and answers with Dr. Bree. Hello, doctor. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, I have a question about something you mentioned early on. Yeah. Uh, you said that there was a lot of discussion about Ecclesiastes getting into the Bible and that there was a lot of resistance to get it against right. it. Why was there a uh, resistance to adding Ecclesiastes into the Bible and what eventually put it over the top? Great question. Yeah. Oh, and and now, now, I guess yeah. another thing is, was this part of like uh, the Nicene Council? Was this a Christian issue or was this even an issue with the Hebrew Bible? Great. Uh, yeah. Great question. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, this, this, this seems to have been a longstanding issue um, and an issue uh, e perhaps even before the time of Jesus, um, uh, uh, where it comes up for us in documents that we have today, that is it's in uh, the Mishnah and the Talmud. Um, those are the earliest uh, uh, compilations of Jewish um uh, kind of law and legend and lore that go back to uh, the time of the, the the transition from the Pharisees to the rabbis, um, uh, which was you know about just after the time of Jesus. Um, so near the time of Jesus, there is um, there's record of a controversy uh, in which some of the, um, uh, the the rabbis, the early rabbis, um, uh, and sort of the transition from from Pharisaic to rabbinic Judaism after the fall of the temple. So around the year 100, let's say, um, so so well before the Nicene Council, um, there was a, a conversation. Uh, among different uh, Jewish sages and rabbis, and uh, one of them had the opinion that uh, that the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, which, which they call Kohelet, uh, and the Song of Songs, this was the other book that was uh, on the, the chopping block, um, that they, they did not, and, and for the Christians, it was the book of Revelation that was on the chopping block uh, more than anything else. Um, uh, but but for, for, for the Jewish tradition, um, Ecclesiastes and the Song of Songs, they said that it didn't, uh, it didn't um, uh, sort of make your hands holy uh, and, and really the word was defile your hands but the idea was that when you held something really holy it had this kind of numinous power that could like get into your hands right so you, when you when you read from a scroll that was holy it, it, it had an extra power to it than just reading a scroll that was kind of normal right so scripture was something different from regular regular scrolls and the, the opinion was um, this one rabbi uh, and several others agreed um, that it, it, it didn't make your hands kind of numb, right? It didn't have this power. Um, it was just a book. Uh, and the reason we think uh, that is, is the, this kind of opinion. I mean, there's a couple things said in the book where, um, you know, we're all going to die. Uh, that kind of, uh, some people can read the book and, and come up with a pretty morose or um, mm -hmm. even sometimes unreligious, unpious, uh, impious um, uh, meanings to the book. Uh, so Ecclesiastes chapter five basically says, yeah, yeah, go to the, go, uh, go, go to worship, go to the temple. Um, but, uh, but just kind of pay lip service sometimes to religious stuff. Um, so uh, all to say that there's, there's some stuff in there that made people really worried, religious folks really worried. Um, at the same time, at the end of the book, chapter 12, there's this epilogue that's added that seems to, at least in some ways, um, uh, try to kind of uh, link this to Torah, to, to Moses's uh, words. Um, so, uh, so that this is, you know, this is kind of the, the, the teacher said good stuff, taught the people knowledge and, and wisdom and so on. And then verse 13 of chapter 12, the end of the matter, all has been heard, fear God and keep the commandments. <laughs> As in like, 
hey, listen, the whole book is about how you should just keep the commandments, but it's not actually, right? It's, a, it's kind of a subversive book in some ways, um, at least in, in some ways, um, uh, to, to some of the uh, perhaps more uh, uh, sort of buttoned up versions of religion that we might think of. Um, and Song of Songs was uh, on the chopping block in, in, in the same uh, meeting uh, or the same discussion, uh, rabbinic discussion, Precisely because it's kind of it's it's erotic poetry, it's love poetry. It's a bit too um, it's edgy for some religious folk, right? Um, now today, the way we think about uh, about Song of Songs is that um, I, I when I teach Song of Songs, uh, oftentimes I'll link it to Ecclesiastes because um, we've been put in these bodies and and given desire for a reason. Uh, there are right and wrong uses of desire, but nonetheless, we should really appreciate the fact that it exists and it's a God-given thing that we desire other people, other bodies, uh, or at least many of us. Um, so all to say that uh, uh, the, I, I see Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs as um, affirming this world, affirming our bodies, affirming our time, our enjoyments, our desires, even, even the, the strange things we find to do as hobbies, affirming all of that humanness um, that is us. And for some religious people throughout history, uh, that has been a challenge. Um, people who want to affirm um, that this world is bad or negative, our bodies are bad, um, that uh, enjoyment is bad, and so on. There's kind of this, uh, you know, sometimes a, a conflict in religious communities about that. Um, thankfully, uh, uh, this rabbinic conversation, which really set the tone for Christian conversations about the canon, um, ended up the, the, the dominant uh, opinion in the end was that Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs should be included. All right, that was a great question from Nathaniel Hood, a prospective student, uh, admitted student, I believe. So we we'll hope to see you in our great breakout in just a moment. We have time for one more question. Yeah. Hello, Dr. Reed. Hey, Alfred, how you doing? Yeah, I'm good, and you? Good to see you, I'm doing great, I'm doing great, yeah. yeah. Thank you for your lecture. Of I, course. I have a short question. You yeah. said something that uh, uh, we shouldn't market Jesus in a way that uh, he would take away the pains and the toss of right. our lives. Right. However, uh, that has been, or that is what has been going on over the years. Right. We have people that in the midst of this pandemic who are affected, mm -hmm. people uh, who are going through trials and challenges in life, and sometimes right. they ask questions why. They ask God why, because they believe that Jesus should be available for them. Right. And in times like this, people who are affected dearly uh, right. are crying and losing hope in Christ and in God. Yes. That why should they be victims. So uh, just opposing this and in the yeah. light of uh, uh, Ecclesiastes, how do we address uh, this issue, especially in terms of pastoral care? Is there mm -hmm. any uh, yeah. concerns? Alfred, that's a great question and thanks for asking it. Yeah, I mean, that, uh, uh, I think there's a, one way that we've, um, and many Christians have talked about Jesus is that Jesus takes away all your pain and suffering. And I think what we see in times like this is that that's just not true. Um, that is uh, that Jesus uh, does not just heal everyone. And we see we think we see this with the miracles, right, in the New Testament. Why is it that Jesus doesn't heal everyone, take away everyone's suffering and everyone's pain? Um, and in many ways, I think it's because the miracles are not ends in of themselves, in the sense that um, the healing miracles and so on are meant to be signs. That's the way the New Testament talks about them. That they are signs of of Jesus's power. Um, and it's like a marker of who Jesus is. And then it's left to the community to really help one another in the wake of the knowledge that Jesus has formed this community to be Christ's hands and feet on the earth and so on. Um, so, uh, so, so this, uh, what I would say is that um, I, I do believe that Jesus and, and through the, the Holy Spirit, uh, that, that Jesus is available to comfort those who are suffering. But comforting those who are suffering um, isn't necessarily the same thing as taking away the pain or taking away the, the disease or taking away even the suffering, um, uh, the grief, right? A lot of times I think that Jesus's comfort to us is to allow us to move through those spaces of grief and even sadness um, uh, honestly uh, and faithfully. That is to direct our laments and our prayers and our griefs to God and to, to, to trust that God is big enough to handle them and to carry us through them. Uh, that's not to say that God can't, can't produce miracles, uh, miracles of, of healing and so on. Um, I do believe that, but uh, I, what I don't want to do is tell people, hey, if you believe Jesus is going to take away COVID-19 from you, because that might not be true, but what Jesus is going to do is Jesus is going to be there with you um, no matter what happens. That, this is why I think, you know, the kind of cry of dereliction from the cross where Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? That uh, even in times of abandonment, um, Jesus has been there too, been there before us. Uh, Thank let me, you. Let me just um, uh, 
uh, end by reading a poem, a poem to kind of sum up our time. And I, I love this poem. It's a short poem by Jane Kenyon. Uh, and Jane Kenyon uh, uh, was a poet who, uh, she wrote this and she did not know uh, when she wrote this that she was uh, dying of cancer. Uh, she would be dead within a year of writing this, but nonetheless, um, uh, uh, she, uh, she knew in some way um, how, how to, to love her life in the midst of crisis. So it's called Otherwise by Jane Kenyon. I got out of bed on two strong legs. It might have been otherwise. I ate cereal, sweet milk, ripe, flawless peach. It might have been otherwise. I took the dog uphill to the birch wood. All morning I did the work I love. At noon I lay down with my mate. It might have been otherwise. We ate dinner together at a table with silver candlesticks. It might have been otherwise. I slept in a bed in a room with paintings on the walls and I planned another day just like this day. But one day I know it will be otherwise. Thank you so much, Dr. Breed. Uh, Dr. Breed, we give thanks for you and gratitude for being here with us today once again. Thank you. Thus conclude the formal part of the presentation. If you are an alum, a friend of CTS, or a current student, and you want to stick around to talk with Julie Bailey and the president, please do so. And admit, uh, admitted students and prospective students, I'm going to push you all to a breakout room right now. <laughs>